Part Seven. After all this had been admitted, and they had that ideas exist, and that other things participate in them, and derive their names from them, Socrates, if I remember rightly, said, This is your way of speaking, and yet, when you say that Sibius is greater than Socrates, and less than Phaedo, do you not predicate of Simeus both greatness and smallness? Yes, I do. But still, you allow that Simeus does not really exceed Socrates, as the words may seem to imply, because he is Simeus, but by reason of the size which he has, just as Simeus does not exceed Socrates because he is Simeus, any more than because Socrates is Socrates, but because he has smallness when compared with the greatness of Simeus? True. And if Phaedo exceeds him in size, this is not because Phaedo is Phaedo, but because Phaedo has greatness relatively to Simeus, who is comparatively smaller. That is true. And therefore Simeus is said to be great, and is also said to be small, because he is in a mean between them exceeding the smallness of the one by his greatness, and allowing the greatness of the other to exceed his smallness. He added, laughing, I am speaking like a book, but I believe that what I am saying is true. Simeus assented. I speak as I do, because I want you to agree with me in thinking not only that absolute greatness will never be great, and also small, but that greatness in us, or in the concrete, will never admit the small or admit of being exceeded. Instead of this, one of two things will happen. Either the greater will fly or retire before the opposite, which is the less, or at the approach of the less has already ceased to exist, but will not, if allowing or admitting of smallness, be changed by that even as I, having received and admitted smallness when compared with Simeus, remain just as I was, and in the same small person. And as the idea of greatness cannot descend ever to be or becoming small, in like manner the smallness in us cannot be or become great, nor can any other opposite which remains the same ever be or become its own opposite, but either passes away or perishes in the chain. That, replied Sebes, is quite my notion. Hereupon one of the company, though I do not exactly remember which of them, said, In heaven's name, is not this the direct contrary of what was admitted before, that out of the greater came the less, and out of the less the greater, and that opposites were simply generated from opposites? But now this principle seems to be utterly denied. Socrates inclined his head to the speaker and listened. "'I like your courage,' he said, in reminding us of this, "'but you do not observe that there is a difference in the two cases. For then we were speaking of opposites in the concrete, and now of the essential opposite which, as is affirmed, neither in us nor in nature can ever be at variance with itself. Then, my friend, we were speaking of things in which opposites are inherent, and which are called after them, but now about the opposites which are inherent in them, and which give their name to them, and these essential opposites will never, as we maintain, admit of generation into or out of one another. At the same time, turning to Sebes, he said, Are you at all disconcerted, Sebes, at our friend's objection? No, I do not feel so said Sebes, and yet I cannot deny that I am often disturbed by objection. Then we are agreed, after all, said Socrates, that the opposite will never in any case be opposed to itself. To that we are quite agreed, he replied. Yet once more let me ask you to consider the question from another point of view, and see whether you agree with me. There is a thing which you term heat, and another thing which you term cold. Certainly. But are they the same as fire and snow? Most assuredly not. Oh, heat is a thing different from fire, and cold is not the same with snow? Yes. And yet you will surely admit that when snow, as was before said, is under the influence of heat, they will not remain snow and heat, 
but at the advance of the heat the snow will either retire or perish. Very true, he replied. And the fire, too, at the advance of the cold will either retire or perish, and when the fire is under the influence of the cold, they will not remain as before, fire and cold. That is true, he said. And in some cases the name of the idea is not only attached to the idea in an external connection, but anything else which, not being the idea, exists only in the form of the idea, may also lay claim to it. I will try to make this clearer by an example. The odd number is always called by the name of odd. Very true. But is this the only thing which is called odd? Are there not other things which have their own name, and yet are called odd, because, although not the same as oddness, they are never without oddness? That is what I mean to ask, whether numbers such as the number three are not of the class of odd. And there are many other examples. Would you not say, for example, that three may be called by its proper name, and also be called odd, which is not the same with three? And this may be said not only of three, but also of five, and of every alternate number. Each of them without oddness is odd, and in the same way two and four and the other series of alternate numbers has every number even without being evenness. Do you agree? Of course. Then now mark the point at which I am aiming. Not only do essential opposites exclude one another, but also concrete things, which, although not in themselves opposed, contain opposites. These, I say, likewise reject the idea which is opposed to that which is contained in them, and when it approaches them, they either perish or withdraw. For example, will not the number three endure annihilation, or anything, sooner than be converted into an even number, while remaining three? Very true, said Zabiz. And yet, he said, the number two is certainly not opposed to the number three. It is not. Then not only do opposite ideas repel the advance of one another, but also there are other natures which repel the approach of opposites. Very true, he said. Suppose, he said, that we endeavor, if possible, to determine what these are. By all means. Are they not, Sebes, such as compel the things of which they have possession, not only to take their own form, but also the form of some opposite? What do you mean? I mean, as I was just now saying, and as I am sure that you know, that these things which are possessed by the number three must not only be three in number, but must also be odd. Quite true and on this oddness, of which the number three has the impress, the opposite idea will never intrude? No. And this impress was given by the odd principle? Yes. And to the odd is opposed the even? True. Then the idea of the even number will never arrive at three? No. Then three has no part in the even? None. Then the triad or number three is uneven? very true. To return then to my distinction of natures which are not opposed, and yet do not admit opposites, as in the instance given, three, although not opposed to the even, does not even the more admit of the even, but always brings the opposite into play on the other side, or as two does not receive the odd, or fire the cold. From these examples, and there are many more of them, Perhaps you may be able to arrive at the general conclusion that not only opposites will not receive opposites, but also that nothing which brings the opposite will admit the opposite of that which it brings, in that to which it is brought. And here let me recapitulate, for there is no harm in repetition. The number five will not admit the nature of the even any more than ten, which is the double of five, will admit the nature of the odd. The double has another opposite, and is not strictly opposed to the odd, but nevertheless rejects the odd altogether. Nor again will the parts in the ratio three to two, nor any fraction in which there is a half, 
nor again in which there is a third, admit the notion of the whole, although they are not opposed to the whole. You will agree? Yes, he said, I entirely agree and go along with you in that. And now, he said, let us begin again, and do not you answer my question in the words in which I ask it. Let me have not the old safe answer of which I spoke at first, but another equally safe, of which the truth will be inferred by you from what has been just said. I mean that if any one asks you what that is, of which the inheritance makes the body hot, you will reply, not heat, that is what I call the safe and stupid answer, but fire, a far superior answer which we are now in a condition to give. Or, if any one asks you why a body is diseased, you will not say from disease, but from fever. And instead of saying that oddness is the cause of odd numbers, you will say that the monad is the cause of them. And so of things in general, as I dare say that you will understand sufficiently without my adducing any further examples. Yes, he said, I quite understand you. Tell me, then, what is that of which the inheritance will render the body alive? The soul, he replied. And is this always the case? Yes, he said, of course. Then whatever the soul possesses, to that she comes bearing life. Yes, certainly. And is there any opposite to life? There is, he said and what is that death then the soul as has been acknowledged will never receive the opposite of what she brings impossible replied sebes and now he said what did we just now call that principle which repels the even or the odd and that principle which repels the musical or the just or the unmusical he said and the unjust and what do we call the principle which does not admit of death? The immortal, he said. And does the soul admit of death? No. Then the soul is immortal? Yes, he said. And may we say that this has been proven? Yes, abundantly proven, Socrates. Supposing that the odd were imperishable, must not three be imperishable? Of course, and if that which is cold were imperishable, when the warm principle came attacking the snow, must not the snow have retired whole and unmelted, for it could never have perished, nor could it have remained and admitted the heat? True, he said. Again, if the uncooling or warm principle were imperishable, the fire, when assailed by cold, would not have perished, or have been extinguished but would have gone away unaffected. Certainly. The same may be said of the immortal. If the immortal is also imperishable, the soul, when attacked by death, cannot perish. For the preceding argument shows that the soul will not admit of death, or ever be dead, any more than three or the odd number will admit of the even, or fire or the heat in the fire of the cold. And yet the person may say, But although the odd will not become even at the approach of the even, why may not the odd perish and the even take the place of the odd? Now to him who makes this objection, we cannot answer that the odd principle is imperishable, for this has not been acknowledged. But if this had been acknowledged, there would have been no difficulty in contending that at the approach of the even the odd principle and the number three took their departure, and the same argument would have been held good of fire and heat and any other thing. Very true, and the same may be said of the immortal. If the immortal is also imperishable, then the soul will be imperishable as well as immortal, but if not, some other proof of her imperishableness will have to be given. No other proof is needed, he said. For if the immortal, being eternal, is liable to perish, then nothing is imperishable. Yes, replied Socrates, 
and yet all men will agree that god and the essential form of life and the immortal in general will never perish yes all men he said that is true and what is more gods if i am not mistaken as well as men seeing then that the immortal is indestructible must not the soul if she is immortal if she is immortal be also imperishable most certainly then when death attacks a man the mortal portion of him may be supposed to die but the immortal retires at the approach of death and is preserved safe and sound true then sebes beyond question the soul is immortal and imperishable and our souls will truly exist in another world i am convinced socrates said Zebi, and have nothing more to object but if my friend simeus or any one else has any further objection to make he had better speak out and not keep silence since i do not know to what other season he can defer the discussion if there is anything which he wants to say or to have said but i have nothing more to say replied simeon nor can i see any reason for doubt after what has been said but i still feel and cannot help feeling uncertain in my own mind when i think of the greatness of the subject and the feebleness of man yes simeus replied socrates that is well said and i may add that first principles even if they appear certain should be carefully considered and when they are satisfactorily ascertained then with a sort of hesitating confidence in human reason you may i think follow the course of the argument and if that be plain and clear there will be no need for any further inquiry very true but then o oh my friends he said if the soul is really immortal what care should be taken of her not only in respect of the portion of time which is called life but of eternity and the danger of neglecting her from this point of view does indeed appear to be awful if death had only been the end of all the wicked would have a good bargain in dying for they would have been happily quit not only of their body but of their own evil together with their souls but now inasmuch as the soul is manifestly immortal there is no release or salvation from evil except the attainment of the highest virtue and wisdom for the soul when on her progress to the world below takes nothing with her but nurture and education and these are said greatly to benefit or greatly to injure the departed at the very beginning of his journey thither for after death as they say the genius of each individual to whom he belonged in life leads him to a certain place in which the dead are gathered together whence after judgment has been given they pass into the world below following the guide who is anointed to conduct them from this world to the other and when they have there received their due and remained their time another guide brings them back again after many revolutions of ages now this way to the other world is not as aeschylus says in the telephus a single and straight path if that were so no guide would be needed for no one could miss it but there are many partings of the road and windings as i infer from the rites and sacrifices which are offered to the gods below in places where three ways meet on earth the wise and orderly soul follows in the straight path and is conscious of her surroundings but the soul which desires the body and which as i was relating before has long been fluttering about the lifeless frame and the world of sight is after many struggles and many sufferings hardly and with violence carried away by her attendant genius and when she arrives at the place where the other souls are gathered if she be impure and have done impure deeds whether foul murders or other crimes which are the brothers of these and the works of brothers in crime from that soul every one flees and turns away no one will be her companion no one her guide but alone she wanders in extremity of evil until certain times are fulfilled and when they are fulfilled 
she is born irresistibly to her own fitting habitation, as every pure and just soul which has passed through life in the company and under the guidance of the gods has also her own proper home. Now the earth has diverse wonderful regions, and is indeed in nature and extent very unlike the notions of geographers, as I believe on the authority of one who shall be nameless. What do you mean, Socrates? said Simeus. I have myself heard many descriptions of the earth, but I do not know, and I should very much like to know, in which of these you put faith. And I, Simeus, replied Socrates, if I had the art of Glaucus would tell you although I know not that the art of Glaucus could prove the truth to my tale, which I myself should never be able to prove, and even if I could, I fear, Simeus, that my life would come to an end before the argument was completed. I may describe to you, however, the form and regions of the earth according to my conception of them. That, said Simeus, will be enough. 